I don't have to remind you about yesterday being the 20 years after the horrible attack that took place on America, September the 9th, uh, September the 11th, 2001. The terrorists out of Afghanistan attacked our country. And for the next 20 years, there's been a war. We have had our forces in Afghanistan trying to make sure it never happened again. Our troops are pulled out. We're no longer at war in Afghanistan. But the war continues. Things are not going to change yet because you see that in order for enemies to stop being enemies, there has to be a change of heart. And that's not happened. So don't expect to say, okay, we're going to have peace on earth, goodwill towards me, and now that we're no longer in Afghanistan. But we're wanting to talk to you about Bible prophecy today. And the fact that all this does fit into Bible prophecy, God foretells the future and He tells us a lot about it in His Holy Word. If you were with us last week, you'll remember we looked at Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 that speak about the war that's called the Gog and Magog War. And in that war, Russia, Iran, and Turkey will come against Israel. They will attack Israel with all-out force. God said it's going to be happening. And when it happens, they're going to meet the God of Israel. And they're going to find that the God of Israel is going to send a tremendous earthquake and shake the ground beneath their feet. He says very plainly that he's going to be sending down fire and hailstone and brimstone and terrific floods. And that five-sixths of those three combined armies will die on the mountains of Israel. The one-sixth that remains are going to return back to their homelands. They're going to flee. And when they get home, they're going to find that God has burned their cities to the ground. The Gog-Magog War. It's a terrible thing, but it will happen. And it's interesting, when we look at that, we say, well, let's see, there's Russia up there in the north, and there's Iran over there, and there's Turkey over there. And, but none of these nations are right on the border of Israel. They're, the one nations that are on the border of Israel, they're not even mentioned. And you've got to wonder why. If you look at a map and you're, you're familiar with the Middle East, you'll know that just north of Israel is the country of Lebanon. To the northeast is Syria. To the very east is Jordan. That, that, he just said amen. Y'all don't worry about him. <laughs> it's okay. And then when you go further south, you find Egypt. And then to the southwest, you see Gaza, the Palestinians. All of these people are enemies of Israel today. And they would be delighted to see Israel off the map. But why aren't they involved in that Ezekiel 38-39 war? They're not even mentioned. I believe the answer is found in Psalm 83. That's the reason we wanted to get to this passage of Scripture. Because in the 83rd Psalm, it tells the little footnote in my Bible, or the note on my Bible says it was a Psalm of Asaph. Most of the time we read the Psalms, we think they're King David. Asaph was not King David, but he was the choir director, Linda, for the whole kingdom, for, for King David. That's as much as we know about him. And he wrote a number of the Psalms. And so this was the prayer of Asaph. He was a very powerful, very important man, and he could see what was coming on. So this was his prayer. Let's read the first five verses together. You don't need to read them out loud necessarily, but please follow along. He says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and have consulted against thy hidden ones. And the hidden ones doesn't mean these people, nobody knows where they are. It means that God has shielded them with his hand. He's protected them. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. These are the same words that we've been hearing for the last 50 years or more from the Muslim nations around Israel. We've got to get rid of this nation of Israel, wipe them off the face of the earth. We don't even want to remember it anymore. Cut them off from being a nation. And they're against God. 
You may not always understand or remember the fact that the war that's going on in the Middle East is a religious war. From the followers of Allah to those who believe in Jehovah. Whether we're talking about Jew or Christian, we believe in the same God. Jews and Christians do, the God of the Bible. Muslims do not. And so there is the clash, and, and that's what the fight is really all about. And so that's what he's saying here. He said, they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. And who are they? Let's see. He names them, and he gives them the biblical names that were current at that time. Understand, geography has changed. Boundaries, borders have changed. Nations have changed. But the people are basically the same. Let's take a look at what he says. Verse 6. The tabernacles of Edom and Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarenes, of Gebel and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. And then he says, Asher also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot. He said, who in the world are all these people? I don't recognize too many of them. Well, let's see. I think we can put this on the screen up there as to who they might be. You have Edom. The Ishmaelites, have you got them? Edom, the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, the people from Moab, and Gebal and Ammon. These are all people that live today in the country of Jordan, east of the Jordan River, east of the Dead Sea. That's where these people are. They're, they're tribes that have been there for centuries, but that's where they are. The Edomites, the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, and the rest of them. And when you see Amman, Amman, you may remember that that's the capital city of the country of Jordan, Amman, Jordan. It's just spelled a little differently. Then the Hagarenes. These were people in Syria. They were in Syria. If you were to look on a map, you'd see that the territory that they covered was actually from just east of the Sea of Galilee up the Golan Heights, which literally it, it's a steep cliff that goes up to the flat plains that goes on to Damascus, Syria. They lived in Syria and in northern Arabia. And the Amalek. Amalek was an interesting guy. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. He said, well, who was Esau? Now, you Bible scholars know who Esau was, possibly. He was Jacob's brother. And if you'll remember, they hated each other. <laughs> he said, Jacob stole my birthright. And on and on and on. And he taught his children to hate the children of Jacob. And Jacob's name, of course, was changed to Israel. And so their grandchildren hated the other grandchildren and on down through the centuries till today. And you know what? Their descendants are still just like that. These are the Amalekites. Are they a nation? No, they're, but they're still a group of Israel hating people. They've inherited that generation after generation. And then the Philistines, well, we think of the Philistines, we think of the Palestinians because that's where the Philistines lived on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in what is called Gaza today. You hear a lot about Gaza this last spring. You heard a lot about the fighting going on between the Palestinians in Israel and the Palestinians being based in Gaza, land that Israel had given to them. Well, they're being named here. And then the inhabitants of Tyre. Tyre is a city on the Mediterranean coast just north of Israel in Lebanon. It's the first big city that you come to. They're named and then Asher. Asher is Iraq. So what countries do we see? We see Jordan. We see Syria. We see Lebanon. We see Gaza. And we see Iraq. These nations are all going to come against Israel. And Asaph could see it. Somehow God had given him this vision saying, they're coming. Oh, dear God, we need you to intervene. Oh, God, don't, don't ignore this. God, please pay attention. God, help us because this is what's going to happen. And these are the nations that are going to come. He said, well, why are they going to come? They've been sporadically fighting over the years. One war after another, ever since Israel's been in existence in 1948, they've had many a battle back and forth across those borders. Why is it all of a sudden they're going to get united? What's going to unite them? Well, one of the things that unites them today is the power of Iran. The Iranians are providing weapons for those in Gaza and Syria and Lebanon, and, and they're wanting fighting proxy wars. 
through their various agencies, the Hezbollah and, and the rest of them. And so at one point in time, they're going to say, we've got enough strength. We're going to ally our forces and we're going to attack Israel from all directions. Is it going to happen? Absolutely. I personally believe it's not too far off. I, I think I see God setting the stage for it to where these independent groups are getting more cohesive and falling under the power and the authority in, of, of Iran and also Russia, which Russia supplies a lot of military equipment to Iran. And they're all trading partners, and they're in this together. And as we saw in the Ezekiel 38, 39 war, they definitely get together. Say, okay, if it's going to happen, and if it was to happen tomorrow, would Israel be prepared for it? In other words, how strong is Israel today? Well, let's take a quick look at this. This is not biblical. This is just factual today. Israel's air defense. Do you all have that for us? Israel's air defense system. It includes first the Iron Dome. If you paid attention to the news this last spring, you heard a lot about the Iron Dome. All the rockets that were being fired out of Gaza uh, from the Palestinians into Israel were intercepted by what they call the Iron Dome. It's a missile defense system where they shoot missiles down with missiles. Very, very effective. They knocked out over 90% of all the missiles that were fired against them. The other 10%, most of them did no damage. So a very good defense system. Do they have it? The Iron Dome, yes. I think partially it was developed in the United States. We've been very good partners with Israel. Well, what about the next one, the arrow system? The arrow system is designed to intercept missiles that are fired at Israel from outside the Earth's atmosphere. Wow. You say, well, those little Palestinians, they can barely throw a rock over the border. How are they going to do that? Well, it won't be the Palestinians. Remember who all's involved in this? Who's developed long-range missiles? They said, we have the ability, if they're coming from outside the Earth's atmosphere, our aero system will take those out. And then there's David's sling system. David's sling system is designed to knock out missiles that are coming at them from anywhere from 25 to 200 miles away. They spot it on the radar. Here they come. Boom. They never get there. Powerful defense system. And of course, the Patriot missile batteries that they have all over the country intercepting drones and other things that are being fired at Israel. They're a tough little country. They've got to defend themselves. They said, we're surrounded by enemies. All of them want to wipe us off the face of the earth. We have the technical ability to knock out just about everything they throw at us. And, and we will. We'll, we'll do whatever we have to do. And they publicly made the statement, listen, if Iran should start amassing troops on our border like they're really coming, we're not going to let them cross it. We'll throw everything we have against that country. That includes right across the border, all the way to the other end of their border. It's not going to be a quick fight. We're not going to go down easily. And they said, we're also watching their nuclear development. And as they're getting closer and closer to having nuclear capabilities, the Iranians I'm talking about, Israel says, They'll never make it. When we see them get to a certain point, we will destroy everything they've got. Do they have the capability? <laughs> yes, they do. I can tell you my first trip to Israel back in the 70s, we found out at that time that Israel did have nuclear capabilities back in the 70s. That's scary. What could happen in the Middle East when this war begins? Well, Israel's military might is very impressive, but it's very minor compared to the power of God. And God is going to be in the middle of this. Let's look at the rest of that prayer that Asaph prayed for his country and for God to intervene. Listen what he's asking God to do. We're going to have to skip down a few verses, down to verse 13. He says, oh my God, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind. Now we think of a wheel, we might think of a wagon wheel, but that wasn't what he was envisioning. He was, what he was envisioning, did you ever see a, a prairie fire or a grass fire when the wind gets caught up in it and it starts to swirl and it goes up like this? 
That's what he was envisioning. He said, God, turn them into that. Turn them into a spiring cloud of smoke before the fire and burn it. Oh, he wasn't wanting God to be nice to them. Burn them like the stubble before the wind. And the fire burneth the wood, and the flame setteth the mountains on fire. And God send down fire on them. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. Oh, wait. Perish? He's not saying, God, stop them. He's saying, God, slay them, kill them, put them to shame, and cause them to perish. And then he gives the motivation behind that. Verse 18, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Take away all their doubts, dear God. Show your mighty power. And when God answers this prayer, the Muslim nations that are going to be attacking Israel, they're going to see the power of God. They're going to find out that Allah doesn't exist. Not only is He powerless, He's non-existent. They're going to find out who the real God is. Well, I personally believe this religious war is on the horizon today. If it's far off, I'd be surprised. You say, well, how did that impact us? What does that have to do with us? The United States isn't mentioned to this. Of course not. The United States wasn't in existence then. Also, you'll notice that we're becoming less and less of the great military giant and power, world power we once were. That may or may not have anything to do with it. Christians are not mentioned. No. Christianity hadn't come along yet when the psalm was written. But Christianity is here. Christianity was in the Word of God and is in the Word of God, and God knows about Christians and Christians. Why aren't we mentioned? I think there's another explanation as to why Christians aren't even mentioned here. I think God has another plan, another track that intersects with this, and this is what I want you to see. If you miss all the rest of this and you'll say, well, that's kind of interesting, I want you to get this part. The question is, Will this war take place before or after the rapture of the church? I want us to talk more about the rapture than about the war. Because this war may or may not impact any of us or all of us, but the rapture certainly shall. Now, not everybody knows what the rapture is. We're going to find out here in just a moment. While you're looking this scripture up, you will find it out. Look up 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Please, you need to read it in your Bible. If not, write it down on that bulletin. And when you get home, look it up in your Bible. You need to realize what God has to say about the event that we refer to as the rapture. That's not a biblical word, but it's a descriptive word that just tells us about the event. Don't be worried about the war. Just be ready for the rapture. I'll probably say that again before I'm through. Here's the scriptures that tell us about what we call the rapture of the church. It says, For the Lord Himself, that means the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout. That tells us that we know exactly where Jesus is today. He is in heaven. You say, well, I thought he died on the cross. Yes, he did. I thought he was buried. Yes, he was. He also rose from that grave. Did he not? Yes, he did. And he was alive and he was seen by hundreds and hundreds of people for many days after his resurrection. But then he ascended to heaven. You read about in the first chapter of Acts. He ascended to heaven where he is right now. All right, so that's where he is. But this tells us he is going to descend from heaven. He's coming back with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's going to come and there's going to be a big announcement in heaven when he starts to come. And he's going to be coming for his own. Keep reading. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. 
In other words, if it happened today, Christians who are alive and remain here shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture of the church. That's the catching away of the bride of Christ. That's what's going to happen to every born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether he have died physically or not. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's called the rapture. The question a moment ago was this war that we're talking about, this Psalm 83 war, is that going to be before or after the rapture? Because we know that the rapture is pretty much the next great event we're sure is on God's calendar. We don't know which one is coming first, the war or the rapture, or whether the war will be going on, the rapture will take place in the middle of it. have no idea. Don't be worried about the war. Be ready for the rapture. In other words, make sure you're in Christ. Make sure you've trusted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. You don't want to get left behind here. You really don't. Because after the rapture of the church, God has a purpose in that. Not just to make us happy and get us to heaven. He can get us to heaven any way He wants to. It is to remove us before He pours out His wrath on this God-hating, Christ-rejecting world. Amen. And when you read in the Scriptures about what is called the Great Tribulation Period, a period of seven years. The first half is not going to be too terribly bad, but the second half is going to be so bad. The Bible says if God does not intervene, no flesh will survive. You want to read how bad it'll be? Just start reading through the book of Revelation. You'll see it. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Oh yeah, that's putting it mildly. Talked about how much of the population shall die. How, many of the, how much of the crops will be burned up? How many fish in the sea will die? How much water will be polluted? How horrible it's going to be? I mean, the world is just about to come to an end. It's, man is going to be destroying himself. Evil shall be taking total control of the world because God taking hands off. He said, I've got my people out. I'm going to take my hands off. I'm going to give you what you wanted. You've always wanted Satan to rule and reign. Well, here it comes. We talk about heaven on earth. Well, it's going to be hell on earth. It's going to be unbelievably terrible. The rapture is to rescue God's children. Those who have said, Dear Jesus, I see you died on a cross for me. I'm a sinner. Please, Jesus, save me. Forgive my sins and save me. I want to be with you when you rapture the church. I don't want to be left behind. If that's been, ever been your prayer, that's what's going to happen if you really meant it. If you're not saying, Jesus, I'm trying to make a deal with you. <laughs> I'll be good if you'll just save me. No. Jesus, take me as I am. I repent of my sins. I want to become all you want me to be. I want to become the man you want me to be. I want to become the woman you want me to be. I want to become the teenager you want me to be. I want you to take control of my life as you forgive my sins, become my Savior, and become the Lord of my life. If you've done that, whenever this rapture takes place, you'll be going. You'll be going. And you shall forever be in the presence of the Lord in heaven. Nothing can change that. You've got the Lord's promise right here. So my question is, are you worried about a war or are you ready for the rapture? Are you included in that group that's going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and ever be with Him? I believe that we are in the latter hours of the latter days, that we're very, very close to this great event, which of course has to do with the war that may be right ahead or right after, I don't know. But we can see the signs of the war, and you can't always see the signs of the rapture, but we know it's coming. The Lord says, it's going to come suddenly without warning. <laughs> Boom, it's just going to happen. How long are you going to have to get ready for it? No time at all. It's going to happen in a moment and twinkling of an eye. No announcement from God saying, tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock we're going. No, none of that. It's, it's, it's over. You're either ready or you're not. I personally think there's a possibility that if we could look into heaven right now, 
we might be able to see that archangel that's mentioned in there. We might be able to see him standing up, <clears throat> clearing his throat, getting ready to make that big shout. Jesus, go get your bride! Or maybe he's lifting that trumpet to his lips, getting ready to blow that trumpet blast. I think if we could look into heaven, we just might be seeing that today. I said, Brother Allen, I think you're all wet. Well, maybe I am, but I'll tell you what, I'm ready. <laughs> Are you? Are you ready? Are you going to be included in that rapture? That's not something you want to leave in question mark on it. You need to know for certain. And the only way you can know for certain is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord right now. Right now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you through your holy word and you've given us all kinds of prophecies and things and you've given us warnings of what to expect. You've prepared us that we might respond to the, your great love. You loved us enough to sacrifice your son Jesus on the cross. Letting him take all the punishment necessary so you can forgive us. If we'll just repent of our sins and say, oh, forgive me. If we'll just call on Jesus to save me, he's promised he would. Dear God, you said in your holy word, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, dear God, if there's somebody here today that has never called on Jesus to save them, I pray they'll do it right now. We know the devil's going to try to give them all kinds of excuses why they shouldn't. But the devil wants them in hell. You want them with you. Oh, Father, I pray they'll listen to your voice. I pray they'll trust your son and cry out, Dear Jesus, save me now, please. Father, we know that if they will, he will. And Father, for Christians that have been saved maybe a long, long time, and maybe we haven't said much about it, help us to realize that we are in the latter hours of the last days, and we need to tell other folks time is short. We need to be urgent in sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with the people around us because nobody goes to heaven without Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.